Hi, y'all. Welcome to our fourth session of the day. Uh, you are joining me with Daryl Howard presenting the history of Japanese printmaking and its influence on Fr French Impressionism. Thank you for joining. Um, we are so lucky to have Daryl here with us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So it's just us. Daryl, I'm going to kick it over to you and then we'll have maybe 10 minutes at the end for questions, but y'all can feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll catch them as we go. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, as Amy said, I'm Daryl Howard. Uh, I um, am in Dripping Springs right now inside of my studio. And I have been a Japanese woodblock printmaker for oh, going on 45 years. So what I'm going to talk about first is the history of the Japanese woodblock print briefly. And then I'm going to move into the idea and fact that Japanese woodblock prints influ influenced Impressionism and mainly in France, but we can go into that in just a minute. First, Japanese woodblock prints were first done in 600 AD and they were done for religious purposes. They were black and white, one wood carving on a block of cherry wood, which this is cherry wood. This block is from 1875. And the print that I had in my collection was actually um, carved and completed in the 1500s. Black and white would be hung in a temple and uh, carved in cherry wood. Fast forward, uh, the Japanese, as you know, in Japan was a closed country. That means that no one else, people couldn't get in, people couldn't get out of Japan. So you have a culture in Japan of a closed society. So what that meant was these people were making woodblock prints basically for themselves. And um, they used it for commercial purposes. And, and how that worked was first pen in a temple. Uh, the first use of color was done around 1700, 1720. And I have an example of a print uh, that is called a surimono. And it is a beautiful courtesan seated with some writing on the page. It was a love poem that someone commissioned the artist to create in a woodblock print. Again, the Japanese never thought this was art. It was for everyday life. The term ukiyo-e, U-K-I-Y-O-E, literally translates as floating world. And floating world in Japan is everyday life. So here you have somebody that really likes this woman and he wants to send her a love note. Well, he commissions an artist, commissions a poet, and the piece that I have is out of a series of 100 poems. And it's, it's exquisite, and it's a picture of the courtesan. What a beautiful thing, but again, it was a love note, not really considered art. So if you go forward to, well, let's say 1820, you're actually going to see multiple colors being used. The surimono that I have, the first one, the Buddhist print was black and white, sumi ink. Then we move to this surimono era from 1720. <clears throat> and then you kind of come to the late 1700s and 1800s. And basically what happened is the Japanese started doing multiple wood carvings for multiple cover colors in their uh, print. And what they were trying to depict were a lot of us have seen kabuki actors, uh, kabuki plays in a Japanese print. You also may have seen a Hiroshige, a landscape, uh, a water, a gorgeous waterfall, but they actually have color in them. The color back then was actually used, uh, the, it was made from vegetables and minerals. And it, so it's all natural color. When you find an antique print that is in good color condition, that means that someone kept it out of light because these early prints done with natural ink had a tendency to fade if you put them in natural light. And the term we used 
views as printmakers, woodblock printmakers in particular, we call uh, the, the color, it disappeared. Uh, it was fugitive. It ran away from the surface of the paper. So you have to be careful with the antique print until about 18, oh, 1860. Uh, Japan opened up when Commodore Perry landed, um, and it, it, he landed actually in the Tokyo area, and that is when we've actually traced it, when the first use of chemical ink came about. It was brought to Japan by the Dutch. Commodore Perry was the first person there, and so then they started trading in Nagasaki, and the Japanese printmakers were like, whoa, this is cool. I can squeeze my color out of a tube instead of cooking flowers and grinding minerals to get the color. How great is this? Well, it is great and it's not great because early on the color was very, very sensitive. Let me show you one of my antique prints. This is by Kuniyoshi. Uh, this was done in 1850. And it's a beautiful uh, courtesan meeting someone traveling down the road between Tokyo and Kyoto. And this would be a Japanese inn that somebody would be staying at. Remember, they did not consider this art. It was, this was kind of for commercial purposes. Um, it was to try to entice you to stay at this Japanese inn on a cold, snowy night. So you have a lady bowing to the gentleman at the gate and it, it would maybe be hung in a tree. I've seen about three examples of this particular print by Kuniyoshi. This one happens to be a very fine example. No two are exactly alike because the color, even though it came from separate blocks of wood, the colors actually ap applied with brushes to the, to the wood block and then the paper is pressed. So when you see areas of gradient color, like this snowy area from white to green. No two inking techniques by this artist Kuniyoshi ever came out alike. Same thing with the darkness coming and the lady, the uh, geisha, who actually would be serving food and possibly playing instruments for the guest. I would want to stay in this hotel. Think about this as a motel advertisement. So like you're driving down I-35 and stay at the La Quinta. This is an advertisement for a really wonderful Japanese inn. For commercial purposes, they didn't consider it art. How many colors are in this? My guess is somewhere around 17 to 25. For every color, they had to carve a block of wood. Now, Kuniyoshi was part of a stable of artists. Kuniyoshi basically did not carve the wood. Kuniyoshi did the, this is the way everyone did this back then. Kuniyoshi would do this original drawing. He would send it probably to Kyoto and there were wood carvers there who carved the 20 blocks for this one print. Those blocks were then given to the master printmakers in Kyoto and the printers would actually pull these prints, print these prints. Then they were given back to Kuniyoshi and he could market them. So in Japan and even through today, the artists rarely carve their own blocks and print their own prints. Some of the contemporary artists don't believe in that and they will do their own carving. So this is a motel advertisement. I want you to look at some color differentiation. This is a great example of when vegetal ink came, went away, and chemical ink came. Look at the pinks and reds in this. It is obviously a chemical color. When you, if you ever run into an antique print uh, at, a, at a store, uh, know that these chemical colors, you can't get vegetable color and mineral color to print this in tints. So these are beautiful, don't get me wrong. And this particular piece was done in 1875. And what you're looking at is a newspaper. Again, woodblock prints in Japan were used for commercial purposes. 
Now, if you really want to wrap your head around how insane this was, there's probably maybe 25 to 30 wood carvings for this. The writer wrote the story for this newspaper. Someone illustrated it. It was sent to Kyoto to have the blocks carved and then the prints printed. This is a newspaper. Maybe four to six weeks later, this would hit the street. So the idea of news being current, now today with the internet, obviously this would be a joke, but it took quite some time for this news of this story to hit the street. This was not done as art. It was done as a newspaper. Well, what happened in Japan, which is really absolutely amazing, is around 1880, the Japanese culture kind of fell out of favor. They did not like antique prints anymore. Even though there were beautiful kabuki actors, there were these gorgeous scenes, there were newspapers, there were love notes to, you know, to people, and the Japanese were like not into it anymore, as it were. But at the exact same time, at this, like, almost died the technique of ukiyo-e in Japanese prints. Well, what happened, there was this artist named uh, Watanabe, and Watanabe is, was a very brilliant man, an artist himself, and he got together a group of artists and formed a new movement of Japanese printmaking. And it was around 1880, and it was called the Shin Honda Movement, the New Print Movement. And would it not be for Watanabe, Japanese printmaking may not have continued because he gathered up artists that wanted to do prints but had there was no market for them. They actually changed the style in which they were working. One of the artists he took on was uh, Hiroshi Yoshida. Hiroshi Yoshida is the father of the man that I trained with in Japan in 1974. I was fortunate enough to live there. I moved there in 1971. I collected antique prints for about two years. Then I was invited to train with this guy named Hodaka Yoshida. Well, I'm 23 years old at the time, and I didn't know Hodaka Yoshida was like a well-known printmaker. So, I had a good friend who told me how I needed to meet Hodaka with all the bowing and the tea ceremonies. At my first meeting, I had to give thank you money. And then I had to come back for another meeting of tea ceremony. And then the third meeting, I brought my portfolio. Of, and at that point, I wasn't a printmaker. I just brought like my drawings that I had done from undergraduate school at Sam Houston State. So Anyway, he accepted me as a student. So one night a week, I rode the train from Tachikawa Air Base to Mitakadai, which is where Hodaka's studio was, and I studied there for a year. The technique that I learned, he learned from his father, Hiroshi Yoshida. Hiroshi died in 1950, is considered one of the founders of the modern woodblock print. So there you have Watanabe, you have Hiroshi Oshida. And then moving forward, Hiroshi had two sons and Hodaka was the middle son. Toshi was the first one. Both of those Japanese are artists are printmakers. And so the Yoshida tradition has carried on and continues today, which is, it, it was, it's a very important printing family in Japan. So, here you have a process that's been done in Japan literally for centuries, and it has continued. Now let's skip back to Commodore Perry coming and the Dutch traders coming into Nagasaki and actually bringing this ink. Well, guess what they did? They found these antique prints, they fell in love with them, and they took them with them back to Europe. They actually we're bringing them for the first time to Europe. Now, there are stories about some of the Impressionist painters, and those of you who know anything about Impressionism probably do, that the Impressionists were in, the reason they even formed is this is a group of artists in Europe 
who formed a rebellion against the French Academy, which was very formal, very traditional. And this, these two things, the uh, lack of love of the Japanese print in Japan was going on at the same time that these prints arrived in Europe. And they happened to end up in the impressionist hands. So as an example, you've got Whistler. He was sitting in a tea house under the London Bridge in 1880. And this guy, the owner, the proprietor of this tea store was unwrapping teacups from Japan. What were they wrapped in? They were wrapped in antique Japanese prints. So Whistler sits there and he starts opening them up and goes, oh, don't throw this away, I love these. So if you Google Whistler and look at his paintings, he is a painter, he is an impressionist painter, how he embodied the antique Japanese woodblock print in his paintings. They are absolutely amazing. The other people that found these prints, and it's, it, it really went into all of Europe, but there was a, an expo in Paris, and I believe it was 1880, and during that expo, there was a Japanese pavilion, and in that pavilion, the Japanese had brought, again, Japan had opened up, Japan was there at this expo in Paris, and they brought antique Japanese woodblock prints with them. So what happened is everybody went to the world, to this fair in Paris, and so did Van Gogh and Monet and Manet and Cezanne and Gauguin, and they saw these prints and they fell in love with them. So much so, there was a dealer who ended up buying up a ton of these prints, and he opened up three galleries in Paris. And it is called, Siegfried Bing was his name, and in the top of one of the galleries that Bing owned in Paris, he housed all of these Japanese woodblock prints, these antique prints that he absolutely loved. Well, Van Gogh and Monet were great friends, and Van Gogh decided to cut a deal with Bing, the dealer, and he told him, if you give me a good deal on these prints, um, I, you know, I want, I want to start selling them. I want to open a gallery. This is Vincent Van Gogh. And when Van Gogh was in Bing's attic, so was Monet. So those of you who have been to De Verne in outside of Paris realize that Monet has this huge collection of Japanese prints. And if you look out onto the gardens outside of De Verne, they're like Japanese gardens. It's amazing. So Van Gogh not only <laughs> collected prints, he ended up with over 600 of them, and he never opened a gallery. So if you look at the Van Gogh paintings historically, you will see antique Japanese woodblock prints stuck to the wall in his studio. One of the things that Van Gogh did is he actually owned this print called Bridge After the Rain right here. And Van Gogh decided that he wanted to learn from the master. So he copied Hiroshi Gay's bridge in the rain, and then he added his own twist to it. He put this border around his painting with this Japanese writing that uh, does not translate to anything. It was basically a design purpose that he decided to try in his work. So Van Gogh literally was copying this antique print. And if you look at the composition of this print, this is something that after he did this, he started using in his own painting. There is a composition trick that the Japanese use, and I, it, it, there's something in the foreground that you know comes up, and it takes you and your eye this direction, and then all of a sudden it'll go this direction, and it holds you visually in the image, and. The, the Impressionists just loved it. They also loved the color that the Japanese printmakers were using. Absolutely amazing. I saw a show, oh, it must have been before COVID, maybe five years ago at the Planton Museum on the UT campus. 
where um, Holly Borum, who is one of the print curators at the Blanton, had curated this show of uh, Durer uh, prints and the artist that copied Durer and those were very collectible. This is way back when in Europe. So artists copying an artist is something that's been going on for a long time. Well, I became fascinated by going to the show at uh, the Blanton and I came back and I decided, I think there's gonna be a lot to learn if I copy a master. So I decided to copy Van Gogh's painting of this bridge. So here's the woodblock print. Here's the painting that is by Van Gogh. And behind me, is a woodblock print by Daryl Howard after Vincent Van Gogh. So I have a woodblock print made, uh, designed from a painting by Van Gogh, who was inspired by an antique Japanese woodblock print. I have never tried copying a painting before. This may be one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. There are 11 carvings that I did for this piece. I do not take my blocks to Kyoto. Uh, so the blocks are actually, I'm drawing digitally now because I've been doing this for over 45 years. So I do my design on, uh, in Photoshop, in Illustrator, and send my file to a man with a CNC router and his computer cuts my wood. The 11 blocks were cut by computer in here, and, but I didn't use just 11 colors. This print has 23 different colors in it. Uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done, but I absolutely love this. And I've got out in front here another image of that print. I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple more of my prints here. Uh, those of you who are from Austin and have been out to Hamilton Pool, uh, which is right down the road from me, this is Hamilton Pool, daytime. Uh, very abstract water coming over the edge. And this is Hamilton Pool by Full Moonlight. So same image, different time of day. Now, some of you may be asking, oh, all you did is change the color on the wood. I did not just change the color on the wood. I had to recarve all of the blocks because when you print with watercolor on a wood block, the wood becomes saturated with the color, and I could not change these brown cliffs into these deep blue cliffs by printing on the same block. I had to carve new blocks completely over again. But you can see the moon in the background and the water coming over the edge, creating the waterfall at Hamilton Pool. Um, I've been in Austin since 75. I moved here from Japan in 75 and have been in this area since uh, the mid 80s. So um, I love the Dripping Springs area and have made woodblock prints for 45 years. The Europeans embraced the Japanese woodblock prints so much that they not only painted images with them, they were influenced by the color, the composition, and the whole movement of the Japanese print. How glorious it was that the Japanese at the same time had lost interest in the antique print and Europe was gaining interest in it. I wanna show you another influence here. Some of you may know Mary Cassatt, and even though she's not a woodblock printmaker, uh, what Mary Cassatt learned from the antique print, if you look at this lady getting dressed, her back is to your face. This is the Mary Cassatt. This is a, an etching by Mary Cassatt. This particular piece is at the McNay Art Institute in San Antonio. The McNay actually has 12 of um, these prints and that is rare for them to have all of Cassatt's prints. And they are exquisite when you see them on display. What did Mary Cassatt learn from this print? 
what she learned was, number one, until the Japanese saw these antique prints, European artists did not put the back of someone in your face in a painting. She looked at this and went, that's okay to do that. And this is an everyday act. This Japanese lady is helping someone else get dressed. So here is Mary Cassatt assisting someone in dressing, totally related to this antique print. And the comparisons are astounding if you start looking. This book that I'm referencing is The Great Way. It was from, it's out of print. It's from the Met in New York City. And I will show you yet another cassette, which Europeans just did not do. Here is an antique print of a woman bathing a child. Here, sorry, it's backwards. And there's Mary Cassatt in a bathroom bathing. A common everyday act, which is what ukiyo-e literally translated it as, floating world, everyday life. So you have Cassatt. If you can find one of these books, it would be a great addition to anyone's collection. Uh, Degas, same thing. Here's a great Degas painting. Uh, this is in the bathroom, combing hair. Again, a very unusual scene uh, for Europe at the time. And there's a Japanese woman who just washed her hair combing it. So the idea of the common people is one of the main things that Cassatt picked up and the composition and the texture in the kimono and the texture on the walls behind uh, in the same room. It, the examples kind of go on and on. They're fabulous. And I personally think that the Impressionists would have gone a completely different route when they were rebelling um, if it would not have been for them having the Japanese print in their hands. It was the perfect timing. I do ask that you go back and look at Japanese prints more closely and then look at the Impressionists more closely. And you, it's an amazing uh, analogy to make. Uh, Tissot, another, here's just these examples. When they brought the prints to the fair, the World Fair in Paris, they didn't just bring prints. In the Japanese pavilion, they brought kimono, they brought pottery, uh, they brought baskets, they brought things from Japan that Europe had never seen. It is astounding to me that Japan was a closed country because of government, and they didn't allow anyone in. So fortunate all of this beautiful objects remained in Japan, and when they left, it was a huge influence all over the world. And you can see these women in Tassat's painting here uh, in kimono on a porch with a Japanese lantern, just as this diptych, this two-piece Japanese print was done. Um, I love it. And I, I always fascinated when I just flip through and, and look at the relationship. Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, this great drawing um, in, a, in a bar, probably, as we know. And then you can look at this uh, Charaku woodblock print. The imagery of even the common person uh, is, is what the Impressionists were doing. So they took that element as well. Everyday people doing everyday things and creating art from it. So I do have some of my tools in front of me and I want to quickly talk about the paper that the Japanese prints are done on. The paper is not rice paper, it's actually a mulberry paper. Um, and it is made, my paper comes from a small village on the Sea of Japan called Fukui. This is Kizuki paper. This is the natural, this is the bleach. And it's made from mulberry fiber. This is actually a piece of pulp from the mulberry tree from Fikui. And what the Japanese do to make this paper, this paper, this village is still there. They still make this paper. Hiroshi Yoshida, 
who was the father of the man I trained with, used this paper for his prints that was made in this village. When I studied with Hodaka, I fell in love with this paper. I am able to still get this paper. I get it from Tokyo. Uh, they bring it from Fukui to this great paper store uh, in Tokyo and I can get it immediately. It is a little expensive. Uh, the paper today is around $40 a sheet and it is absolutely beautiful paper. It does have to be dampened down when you print. And the ink is actually made from watercolor, grade A, so it's not fading, I hope. Uh, Japanese rice paste, which is pH neutral, and just a touch of glycerin. The glycerin keeps the watercolor wet longer. Because if you think about what the Japanese are doing and what I have done for 45 years, I'm painting watercolor on a block of wood. Then I have to get a piece of damp print paper, lay it on the block, and get it through the press before the ink dries. So the glycerin keeps the watercolor damp just a little bit longer. Plus the paper is damp as well, and that holds it. The ink is applied to the blocks with these fabulous brushes. I, last year before last, found out that the majority of the bristles used in these brushes are pony hair, and I happened across a brush maker who had pony hair outside of Philadelphia, and he just created a whole set of brushes for me. It's absolutely beautiful. My brush maker in Japan passed away. I wasn't able to continue buying my brushes there, so I found someone else in the United States that has helped me create brushes so that I can continue to get the ink on the wood. So I have behind me here uh, an example of one, two, three, four, five, six carvings for this one little print down here sketched outside of Taos, New Mexico. So what you have is a sky. I usually work from light to dark and the Japanese work from light to dark. There's the carving for the sky. Everything's done backwards. I paint watercolor on the block. This paper is then pressed against the wood to transfer the color. These are printer's proofs from each individual block. So you can see how abstract it is until you get to the very end. The set of prints at the bottom are progressive prints. So this is the sky. This is some of the shadows. This is the mountains in the background, more shadows, more mountains, more shadows. Finally, you get to the last block, which we call the key block, to get the whole composition to come together. So there's a couple of things you have to think about when you're a Japanese printmaker. Number one, everything is done backwards. And truth be told, I am dyslectic, and I've made my living at being dyslectic, which I think is, that is great. Uh, you can ask my husband. I don't know my left from my right. And now, as I've gotten older, I don't know up from down even anymore, which is kind of fun, but not. Uh, so it's a perfect media for me to actually work in. Um, I have all these absolutely gorgeous tools, and I've done this, again, for over 45 years and absolutely love it. So the Japanese woodblock print is an extremely special process that um, I'm going to be doing until I'm not on the planet anymore. So if any of you have any questions or comments. I got some questions for you, Daryl, from the chat. That was just so amazing. We had several questions. Um, okay. I'm going to start up at the beginning. Um, do you know if the Shinahanga movement started, and I apologize for my pronunciation, started in response to interest from the West, or did it start first and then Westerners got interested? Absolutely did not start from the interest in the West. The Shinhanga movement was created to save woodblock print printmaking in Japan. If you study Watanabe and why he formed this group, uh, he was determined to not let Japanese printmaking die. And would it not be for Watanabe, it would have. Uh, it had nothing to do with how the Europeans had fell in love 
with a Japanese print and started collecting them. Even though the dates, you would assume that would be the situation, but it wasn't. Okay, moving next. What brought you to Japan in the 70s? And did you meet any other notable artists while you were studying under Hadaka? Ooh, good question. Well, fate brought me to Japan. Um, my first husband, uh, this is 1970, December 1970, uh, was draft number 33. It was the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, he was uh, an electrical engineer studying at Texas A&M and got into the ROTC so he wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. So what happened is he graduated in his, uh, he was in the Air Force ROTC. His first assignment was Yokota Air Base, Japan, and it was an accompanied assignment. And I was able to go with him for four years. I was 21 years old. I had a BFA degree from Sam Houston State. I had taught art for a year and a half prior to that. And I ended up teaching for the DOD schools, Department of Defense schools, for the four years that I was there. And so fate brought me to Japan. And I, there were officers' wives who landed in Japan and they wouldn't leave the Air Force Base because they were afraid. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. So, you know, I, I have always been kind of out there. So I would get on the train after teaching all day at Tati and by myself ride all the way downtown Tokyo and then wander the dark streets to Hodaka Studio. In the winter when it was really cold, there were, the, there were all these vendors were on the street. I mean, the thought of Japan back then was fabulous. There was a guy with a cart, and I'll never forget him. And it, there were coals, and he had hot baked sweet potatoes in his cart, and they were baked in rocks. And on a cold, and we're talking Japan, weather very similar to Washington, D.C. So I would buy two sweet potatoes, put them in my jacket pocket, and use them as pocket warmers. Then I would go study for a couple of hours with Odaka, and on the train back home, I would sit on the train and eat my sweet potato, which was had cooled down enough. So that's how I ended up there. Did I meet any other artists? No, there were no other artists studying in the studio in which I studied. What I did, who I did meet was Fujio Yoshida, who died. She was a hundred years old when she died. That was Hodaka's grandmother. I had tea with her. I met Chizuko Yoshida. Chizuko was Hodaka's father. Famous printmakers, Google them. Uh, Google uh, Fujio. Fujio is an amazing printmaker. And then Toshi, Hodaka's brother. So the only artists I met were carrying the family tradition on, basically, and part of this very well known family. This is so rich. Um... We, okay, so we have several other questions. One that's re repeating is, what is the name of the book that you presented with? The yellow one. Uh, okay, uh, let me get to the front of it. It is The Great Wave, and it is was copyrighted in 1974 by the Met. And let's see if there's other information on here. Uh, let me hold this up. That's the great I'm way, yeah. the influence of Japanese print uh, woodcuts on French prints. Perfect. Beautiful. Screenshot so, that, folks. Can you see it? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see here. So several kind of variations of this question is, one, do you do workshops? And if slash you do or you don't, what would you recommend for a beginner, a beginner artist um, specifically an international art student in the U.S. interested in learning more about Japanese woodblock printing process? Well, before COVID, uh, during Print Austin, which is as part of that, I did workshops here in my studio. I have this glorious new studio, and I can have up to 20, 20 students in here studying privately with me. It was an afternoon class that I offered through Print Austin. And because of COVID, it's not safe for anyone to come, nor is it safe for me <laughs> as an older person to be around people. Uh, will I return to doing those? Absolutely. Um, I do plan on doing some workshops, but 
Because of that question, I'm intrigued and I may try to figure out how to do an online class for people to register and work with me. And I would furnish all of the materials and supplies so that you would have some success at printmaking. Where that's an idea. Thanks for asking it. Yeah, that's a great question and a great suggestion for you. I mean, you would host such a great yeah. workshop. Where, yeah. if that became a reality, where could they find that information? On your website? Could they subscribe? Would you send out a newsletter? Right. If they go to my website, uh, you can sign up to be part of my uh, emails that I send out. And when I do workshops or if I do anything like this online, you would get notified if I've got your email address. So I encourage you to go ahead and sign up on my website uh, and say what your particular interest is. And then I, I think what I'll do is just start a little uh, section of interested people wanting to study. I do not want to see this process die. I have fire in my belly to keep Japanese woodblock prints alive. I've done it my whole life. I actually, I love the Japanese print. Um, it is such a beautiful media and I want other people to learn. I have a young woman who's been in the studio, uh, Sindel Roberts has been around forever and she is a, she is a master printmaker now. And uh, yeah, I want to see people continuing this. It's so much fun. <laughs> So amazing, Daryl. Thank you. The, so the, the other, along those lines, did you meet any female or women printmakers in Japan when you were working there, carrying well, on the family? Of course. I met Chisako, and Chisako Yoshida, uh, God, I forget when she died. It could have been 19, um, I don't know the date that she passed away. Let's see, just a minute. Oh, 2017. Wow. Okay. Chisako Yoshida <laughs> was the, the wife of the man I trained with, and she just recently died three years ago. Um, and you really should Google her work. It's very interesting. I've got, I've got a little note that's kind of curious, because when you look at Chisako's work, you'll find that it's extremely abstract. Hiroshi Yoshida, who was Hodaka's father, I'm not going to use the H word, greatly disliked contemporary work, abstract. So here's Hodaka, here's Chizuko, here's Toshi, and all of their work until their father died in 1950 was very traditional. It was realism. So as soon as Hiroshi died, when you look at, at Hodaka and Chizuko and, and even Toshi, their work is totally abstract. <laughs> They've got this whole series. It was like this pent up desire to do abstraction. But at, to answer the question for female artists, those were the only two that I actually met, and those two made a living. Think of it, Fujio and Hiroshi made their living in 1920 doing Japanese woodblock prints and selling them. They caught a boat to the United States, had shows in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, sold out everything they did. They made enough money that they bought a boat ticket to Europe, had shows there, and were creating art while they were on in route and sold out there. Very successful printmakers. So those printmakers that are listening to me, you can do this as an occupation, believe it or not. That is inspiring to all of the young artists out there. Thank you, Daryl. Sure. Well, we've, we've hit our time. Uh, we're right right on time. Um, I want to thank you so much and all of our attendees for joining us to listen to Daryl pull all the wisdom out of you as that you're willing to share. Um, please visit Daryl's website, sign up for that newsletter, sign up if you're interested in workshops with her, and go visit her profile on the Print Expo page. You can learn more. And that's yeah. it. Great. Thank we're you for great. doing it. We love Print Expo. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl.